we have tonight two guests for our program, and they are going to introduce themselves and tell us what they do. So I'm the one who I think most of you know already. I'm Walter Saul, the president of the Christian Fellowship of Art Music Composers. And I have been composing since I was seven, which means I've been at it for about 61 years. And uh, I attended Duke University where I met my wife who happens to be the sister of Anne Johnson Harwell, who is our other guest. And uh, then I went on to Eastman School of Music where I got my master's and my doctorate in three years before they passed a rule saying you had to spend two years on each degree at least. And I made deadlines by hours and barely uh, escaped. So I only just recently went back to Eastman to hear uh, the brass uh, choir of the Eastman School Symphony Orchestra, which is all the uh, orchestral players in the junior, I mean, in the uh, freshman and sophomore classes of Eastman performed that piece, which was very exciting. Eastman just turned 100 this year, or um, a couple of years ago, really. But And so this performance has been uh, greatly, uh, uh, <clears throat> greatly uh, postponed because of COVID, but uh, we finally got to hear it. Bill, I suspect you have a tape of, 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 of that. Yes, part. I will put that on right now. I need to share the screen, share the sound, share. And then I need to click this and make the screen bigger. So tell us Thank about that. Walter, could you tell us each chord for each measure that we heard? I could if you really wanted me to. But I bet you could. David, uh, 
uh, I, I'm respecting uh, David's uh, time at this respect. So at this point, um, it does start off with an A minor chord and eventually it pretends to be an A flat major, but I think it comes off more as E flat mixolydian ultimately, but uh, it's one of my more festive pieces. And uh, while I was there, I actually flew across the country uh, spending about $1,600, well, yeah, about uh, $1,000 a minute to hear this piece. But I also got to do some things that I should have done as a student at Eastman. I enjoyed the full colors, which are blazing between Buffalo and Rochester. Uh, as I drove between the two cities, something I never did, I got to sit in Eastman Kodak Theater for three hours just listening to rehearsals, something I never did. And then something I did for the second time, I went down to where the old dormitories were, where I proposed to my wife. And the place that used to be outside where I proposed to her is now uh, the Rochester School for the Arts, probably about the lobby area. But I got to film all, I got to take pictures of all of that and uh, get to relive those great moments as well. So, uh, Walter, what was the name of that piece? Fanfare for Eastman. And I'm going to get it up on my website soon. I just haven't had the time. Uh, this is the first uh, time we've actually road tested the Vimeo um, of, uh, of this new uh, video. So uh, great to sh get to share it with this group. But as far as one of the things that I've been doing lately, um, I'm looking back and I think it's been fully 10, if not 11 years since Anne Harwell uh, and I started a project together. Or I, I basically followed say several years, if not a couple of decades behind Anne. We know that Anne's quilts or her fabric art are just breathtakingly beautiful. I heard music in them. And so in 2011 or so, I started to, uh, we had this cool idea, or at least I, have, I thought it was cool, to uh, as we put her quilts pictures upon the website of her website that she would have about a minute piece for each one that would play in the background as uh, the quilt was being exhibited on the website. Well that proved a little too much to deal with in terms of uh, website operation so it's morphed a little bit. But at about 2013, I completed a set of 46 pieces that basically showcased 118 of Anne's quilts. Uh, pretty much all that I knew she had created up to that point. Um, and several of you have taken the interstellar space trip with me uh, in the production of quiltings. But uh, an awful lot of my creative uh, activity has been about Anne's quilts in the last decade or so. And that's one reason I've been so eager to introduce my sister-in-law to you all. So I'm really quite thrilled for this moment. Um, so uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Anne because she has so much to share with you and to show you. And if you're in gallery mode, you may want to switch to speaker mode so you can really zoom in to see what Anne does every day. And I think I'll just turn it over to you, Anne. Oh, okay. Well, uh, I think I started sewing at a younger age than when you started composing, Walter, if you can believe that. <laughs> I can. I really can. So I can I can show you the um, sewing machine that Santa Claus gave me, but that's probably 
not that interesting. <laughs> so oh, yes, it is. Start, <laughs> well, I'll just start with what I start with, which is a pattern. I make a pattern out of a drawing. And this is the next piece that I'm going to do. Wow. So that's, I, I draft a pattern using straight lines and then cut out each little section. And using a piece of fabric, I will uh, add a seam allowance. This is a group, this is really my inventory. And this is my palette, these fabrics. And you told me something that I felt you stole from us musicians. <laughs> you said you auditioned every piece of fabric that's in oh, yes. these uh, closets. And there's yes, sewing. The and there's a, the, the sewing machine that Santa brought you, right? Yes. The fabric has to audition before it can make the cut. <laughs> <laughs> it must. Yeah, so these these are the fabrics that will be put on, you know, I'll cut out uh, the pattern from. So I think that's most of my studio. Then this is this is the sewing machine that I use every day. It's a little singer that my mother gave me. It's from the 40s. And wow. this is the machine that I quilt on. And it's basically the same kind of machine. It's a straight stitch sewing machine made out of metal that um, it doesn't even have a zigzag. But that that's a little introduction. Uh, so I'm not sure what else y'all would like to know. Well, but my quilts yeah. have been all over the world. They've been in American embassies. They're um, I've I've been selling my work since 1996, and that's. That's very exciting because it kind of gives me a a reason to make this my full time job. <laughs> <laughs> and I work more hours than ever mm -hmm. at this point because I get up early. And what else am I going to do? It's just wonderful to be able to walk right into my studio in my pajamas and get to work. Mm. <laughs> I'm very thankful that I can still do this. You know, you don't know how much time you have. But if anyone has questions. Yeah, uh, Anne, uh, uh, I'm going to ask you a question that uh, sometimes uh, drives songwriters crazy. But uh, I'm interested in learning more about uh, how you uh, pattern. Do you sort of do you have a pre you go into it with a preconceived notion of what you're going to want it to look like or you just sort of uh, follow along wherever the uh, pencil seems to get, want to go on the paper? Both. Really, it's both. I start with a plan, but the plan cannot be religiously stuck to. It just can't. It's going to change. There are fabrics that I'm, I'm sure will be the perfect thing. And then... I will not be able to use them mm. as it turns out when I start to to sew them together. It, you, I like your uh, what you said about auditioning uh, fabrics, but uh, what determines uh, what fabric makes the cut and what doesn't? Oh, only cotton, uh, uh -huh. only um, one hundred percent cotton, because it irons so well together. Um, I don't like to use synthetic fabrics at all. Ah. So they basically have to be cotton. <laughs> but they're, it's a combination of commercial fabrics 
batiks and hand dyed and hand painted. I have done that myself, but I would prefer to buy the wonderful um, hand painted fabrics that people are making now. Ooh. And I love the batiks from Indonesia. Those are wonderful. I love African fabric as well. So you go all over the world. I'm going to know some of well, the I don't. My my quilts go, but I don't. I don't go. <laughs> well, speaking of where your quilts go, and I think uh, it'd be fun and not too boastful, maybe a little boastful. <laughs> if you would just tell us where your quilts have been going lately. They've been in a lot of shows lately. Yes, I have one in Fiber Art International, and it's going on a tour. I believe it's going only in the in the States, but um, it's going to several different states. <laughs> um, an exciting thing that happened to me this year is I won... Uh, an exhibition, a solo exhibition in South Carolina at um, Art Fields, which is really my favorite competition and show. But um, I was given a solo show and I'll have 48 quilts in this 5,000 square foot space. Wow. That's amazing. Oh, so excited. That'll be. <laughs> That'll be the whole Jupiter series, my whole dinosaur series, and many of my floral and astronomy pieces. Oh, well, I want a gold award. My husband is pointing out things that I should talk about. Um, <laughs> I won a gold award in Tokyo at the Tokyo Metropolitan Museum. That was very exciting. But it was a long time ago. Uh, I've been in, goodness knows, it, it, wait, just come and tell me what you're, no, he won't. <laughs> tell, Sorry. Us about, tell us about the whole National Geographic story. That oh, yeah, that that's story. really. From the beginning. <laughs> okay, well, they really gave me a great start in my career because they insisted at National Geographic that I needed a website. And this started because I wrote them a thank you note on the um, postcard of a quilt that had my first quilt that sold in my first solo show. And I wrote them a thank you note saying, thank you for your astrophotography because it really inspired me. This was the first time I had seen the Hubble photos and they were just overwhelming to me. Um, so I made a quilt about the comet, the Hellbop comet, which I could see from our backyard rock, but I couldn't see the blue ion tail. And National Geographic came out with a gorgeous picture of it with the blue eye on tail. <laughs> so I sent them a thank you note and they called me and said, can we send a photographer to your home? And I said, well, but that quilt has sold. And they said, I'm sure you can borrow it back. And <laughs> oh my goodness. So, so they, they um, I was in the magazine in April 90, 1999. And that just led to so many other opportunities at NASA a friend now named Don Savage interestingly enough <laughs> he, pulled, he pulled the Hubble photographs that they had on the wall off and sent them to me to be inspired so I had to do a quilt about every one of those photos <laughs> and that was that was a really exciting. And time. I know that Hell Bop was certainly one of the, it may have been the first piece that I wrote inspired by your quilts. I think so. I think so. What can you tell us about Flora since we want to 
actually we have not seen any of your work in right now on the program other than a sketch. Oh. So uh, okay. if we put on the Tapa series five flora, which is the longest piece, uh, we'll be able to get though we're what you're actually talking about, including all the fabrics, you'll see all those different patterns that um, um, it's, well, it's I can take the computer and show you some of my floral pieces. Well, why don't we put on the uh, tapas tapas series flora right now? That would be uh, yeah, perfect. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, let's see. Share screen. Share. I believe, Walter, if, it, if this is not right, let me know. But I believe the pronunciation is tapisseries. Tapisserie, yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. We'll go to the French, uh, uh, to, to my sweet, to our, my sweetheart, your sister, the French expert. There we go. <laughs> Sophie. Uh,
Thank you so much. Thank you. And Anne, thank you so much for those wonderful, good source art that truly inspires my work. Um, yeah, someone yeah. has uh, asked me to ask you, how many pieces of fabric, like the fabric we saw in your auditioned cabinets, how many pieces of fabric go into one of your typical pieces of fabric art? Well, they vary quite a bit from each other, but usually hundreds of different fabrics. I try to use as many, <laughs> as many as possible. Because I just like the variety and, and I feel sad if I can't use all the fabrics that <laughs> I possibly can. I get that. Well, I love the, the backgrounds, even, you know, the the flowers came out in the foreground and, and it was just wonderful to, to watch that. But even the background hmm. made everything come together. And and the, the green leaves were, you know, were always different from one thing to another, you know, but I, I, it was just no. fascinating. <laughs> What a nice thing to say. I really appreciate that. And you're, I, very, you're very sorry. Go ahead, David. Uh, as you probably know, uh, artwork of very, has various kinds has inspired thousands of pieces of music. And yet most of those pieces that have been inspired by art uh, occurred after the artist was long gone, like uh, Paul Clay, uh, the Swiss artist, died in 1940. So of the 900 pieces that have been inspired by his artwork, he didn't hear a single one of them. So I, I'm just wondering, as an artist, what is your reaction to having your artwork set? I, never mind that as your brother-in-law, just in general terms, uh, how would you describe the feeling that you get from, from seeing this artwork of yours having inspired another artistic form? It's, it's as though it has another dimension to it now. I love hearing and and seeing it at the same time that just that's just beyond words for me <laughs> i i think that he captures it so well and i am so very grateful that i can can hear that i don't know if anybody noticed me smiling when the thistles quilt came up but the, <laughs> the music got a lot more prickly at that point and yes. i was smiling <laughs> I loved it when it changed with um, levitation. <laughs> the, the music seemed to levitate as well. <laughs> Actually, that leads me to a question I have for uh, Walter. Uh, Walter, I asked uh, uh, Anne a little bit about her process. Now I want to ask you about uh, yours. As you look at these uh, quilts and set out to capture them in music, do you try in your composing to somehow... Uh, uh, imitate the uh, patterns in the quilt, or you just uh, react to the visual and just uh, write down what sort of uh, comes to you just looking at it? Yeah, I like that question. <laughs> That's a great question, Don. Thank you for it. Um, I know that very often I would like um, to have the piece in a familiar form. You may have noticed that we just heard a set of variations and a concluding fugue. And so if I am going to set, if I might use that word, set a group of quilts that are related in music, I have found a theme and variation set to be a good way to go about it. But for the most part, it's just simply looking at these amazing pieces of fabric art hmm. and just being quiet and listening. Because if you do listen, music will come. Hmm. And now it's actually very interesting. Um, and just something I would shout, say to all of you composers, keep a notebook of your trash ideas, the ones that you've rejected because you cannot uh, use them anymore. I'm sure that Anne has many pieces of fabric that didn't make one quilt, 
maybe uh, 10 years ago that are going to get into a quilt eventually. I wrote a couple of sets of themes and variations way back when I was maybe a senior in college in rebellion against what I was being forced to write, namely total aid tonality, come up with your own form. I think and many of us in our age bracket uh, know um, what it was like to kind of be forced to be original and yet sound an awful like, lot like Arnold Schoenberg. But uh, so I rebelled and I composed those pieces. I put them away. I didn't even finish them. But when I started seeing the Flora series, that brought one of them back to my mind. And somehow I was able to find one of the, you know, dozens of notebooks I have kept over the years and find the piece. And so I retooled it. I made sure that was really finished. And I made sure that the uh, Scottish thistles really prickled. And, uh, you know, I like the idea of going from tonality to atonality and other musical languages um, as it deems fit. My mentor, George Rockberg, showed me how to do that. And I think it's a cool way to do things. And I think it makes things interesting. So um, this is actually going to be the story of Flora and the story of Jupiter. Um, and I'm surprised by how well things have worked out. Um, it's given my music new life, for one thing. And I think these were the pieces that the Lord meant to accompany and set these quilts, even though <laughs> when they were composed, uh, the quilts certainly hadn't been um, uh, created yet. So, it, it's a very, um, it's not a cerebral reaction, it's, uh, it's what we would call a visceral reaction mm -hmm. to the beauty of the fabric art that Anne has posed before us. Well, let's listen to Jupiter. Can, I, I, can just, I ask a question? Yeah, let's go right ahead. Um, so when you're putting together the uh, presentation of the of the quilts with the music, how do you choose the order of the quilts? In this case, it was a matter of looking at uh, the range of quilts. Um, so, uh, you know, what will be displayed? What seems to go with what piece of music in this case? Much of the time, uh, you know, when we, I, we were doing quiltings, you know, a decade ago, I got the idea that Anne's quilts, at least the ones that she had uh, created up to that point, could form a journey from earth up to heaven. And so that was a great way to set the order. I still talk about it as uh, a lot less expensive than SpaceX. <laughs> in terms of really going on a trip. So, um, and I do believe that Anne's quilts are the key to that, but that in a way made everything so much simpler.
How did you get interested in astronomy, And Oh, well, it really started when National Geographic um, and with the Don Savage at NASA sending all the Hubble photographs and this new uh, James Webb telescope. Oh, that's amazing. It's opened up a gazillion more wonderful, wonderful. I really don't understand why everyone isn't just going crazy over the photos we get from space. And when you think how far away these things are, it's just beyond comprehension. <laughs> There's a, a little story I want to tell about, uh, you've heard of Carl Sagan, some of you, and he was of course, as m many astronomers, but not all, an avowed atheist. And he would always say billions and billions. <laughs> and he would talk about how everything is an accident. One time I was driving, it was past sunset toward the West. And I had just been listening to Cosmos, his series as many years ago. And it's getting me really depressed. I felt like a, a little tiny speck in an enormous universe. That they could, you look at it the other way, the, the enormous universe is, is what God has created. It's just awesome. But yeah. however, he, uh, so I was feeling that way. And then I looked up and at the car in front of me, I was stopped at a light and the bumper sticker in the car said something I've never seen before or since. You cannot see God through the most powerful telescope on earth. So more even than the universe is God himself. And, and that we see through Jesus, who is even better than, than the Hubble and, uh, James Webb. Webb. Yeah, but they are wonderful. And, and, and the heavens tell of the glory, not just of the glory of God, but they speak about God. They, they actually are speaking to us. That's in Psalms, but that's the case. Um, how can anybody look at how God created and, and, and made it possible for the telescope to do what it's doing because God's laws are so precise and so faithful that that is able to be accomplished, you know, in those gazillion de depths, all because of the way God made the world. How can they people say, oh, accident? <laughs> you know, it just blows my mind. <laughs> Well, I'll tell Jerry, I just don't have enough faith to believe that it could be an accident. Yeah. yeah. I, I have a question for Ann and Walter. So you have made these, um, these video presentations and the combination of the, the artwork from the quilts and the, and the pieces. And so what are your goals with are you going to do anything with these or with the produced video? Well, I'll jump in and just say that one of the things that I have been doing, um, I've actually presented quilting several times live. And that gets interesting because I have to memorize the music and I have to have a reliable computer monitor near me at the piano to be able to follow the quilts and to be able to match up. Um, I can't do it less in the studio what you're all seeing right now. So 
Um, I have presented both quiltings and both these two new tapisserie series that we have seen now in several places. I just got back from Iowa as a composer and resident at um, Cornell College in Mount Vernon in the Cedar Rapids area, uh, presenting uh, these two series live. And then as soon as I got home, I presented them live again at our brand new uh, Work and Teen Culture and Arts Center at Fresno Pacific University for our uh, senior professionals group, which is all of our retired faculty and other people who, and, you know, so uh, that's the biggest way that I try to get them around. Uh, we do have a video uh, for sale that David actually produced of quiltings. Uh, and you can, um, Order it on my website. Yeah, you can see the individual videos. If you want to go through all 46 videos, be our guests. They're available. But uh, we'd love to provide you with a full length movie that's about 75 minutes long. And I guarantee that the 118 quilts are alone worth the price of admission. They're also and, on, on the Vimeo. And uh, many, and all of these are on uh, the Vimeo of Daphne Johnson, who somehow is related. Daphne Saul. To, yeah, Daphne Saul. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Daphne Johnson Saul, That's who's so somehow funny. related to Ann Johnson Harwell. So. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, like, thought about trying to, like, get them presented in a, like, as a video in a contemporary art museum or anything like that that's a good idea i oh. have made overtures mm -hmm. not successfully not to this point go ahead Dan. well i would love to have the just the music um playing during a reception to one of my shows for instance this this one in um in south carolina i would love to have the music as a part of of that show, somehow um, playing continually, but you know, I just don't have the technical expertise. Um, and if you if you ask your brother in law real nicely, I bet he'll send you a CD of the music that you can just put in a player and put it on repeat. Well, that's true. And you could also have a, the videos. You could have a, t a TV monitor in where the exhibition is, where it's playing all the time, a loop mm -hmm. of the things. That would be the most obvious thing to see Way both to do it. and the music. Just, just get a CD player and or, just or okay. You can have just the iPad uh, and and uh, a Bluetooth speaker connected to it or something like that. There's mm -hmm. lots. Things, yeah. We, I, I would really enjoy that. I hope that we can work that out because I think that would would enhance the show yes. in a way. But um, having it shown in an art gal uh, in a gallery or a museum is a very difficult thing to arrange. You, you almost have to know somebody. Yeah. I actually did pull that off at the Fresno Art Museum one time. We pre presented quiltings all the way through. That's true. Yeah. And but that was tough, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, they actually thought they were doing me a favor by not charging me uh, the rental of the hall. You know, yeah, but we had. So no, it's a great idea, Heather, and you are so good at uh, finding opportunities to make things work like that. I really look up to you for how you are able to bring value um, to things and to uh, enable people to enjoy and reward the artist. Uh, we look up to you for what you are able to do in that area. Thanks. <laughs> so. Yeah, that's a great question. It's a great challenge. Mm -hmm. But we need to know that whatever we create has value. And it isn't determined by the number of people that see it. And, and we also need to, I always have to say this, 
because they've learned it the hard way and I'm still learning it, I suppose. I hope I'm through learning it. That our identity is a gift from God. It is not by what people think of us. On that very profound note, Bill, I'm going to have to bow out. But when you send us the uh, the uh, uh, recorded version of this, I will see what I missed. Uh, yes. Try leave Great now. to have you with us. I'm David, thank you so of. much for joining us. It means a lot to see you there. I mean, you've produced, what, five or six of my CDs now? And, you know, the DVD, I, I owe you incalculable gratitude and a whole lot more. Thank you. Well, you're very welcome. It's my pleasure to, to help uh, promote worthwhile music, which yours certainly is, and also worthwhile art. Is, and, I mean, I hope you won't think this is faint praise, but you are, your quilts are the nicest quilts I've ever seen by any artist. I've seen a few. Thank you so much. They are really wonderful. Thank you. So, I appreciate that. And I really appreciate you as well. Well, all right. Well, I'll bid you all adieu. And we'll see you in a future listening room, if not elsewhere. Hope so. <laughs> all right. Good night. OK, good, good night. night. Bye, David. Uh, I was just wondering, uh, are, have you got some future plans for uh, setting more music to more quilts? Oh, Jerry, I do, actually. Um, the only trouble I've had with what I have endeavored to do with Anne, she keeps making more quilts. <laughs> and so I keep uh, thinking I, I need to write more music. And uh, I have been a little frustrated lately. I just haven't found the time to do that. But um, there are a number of piano pieces that I've written that um, I think may actually uh, work awfully well with some of Anne's quilts that I am going to try to audition with Anne and see if they can make the cut as well. But, um, uh, in any case, I do that as uh, an artist who is just blown away, as I'm sure all of us are, by what Anne has done. I mentioned Schoenberg a while ago and how we had to become original by somehow sounding like Schoenberg. There is an interesting relationship between Arnold Schoenberg and Anne Harwell that might be worth examining. Both are self-taught. Uh, and I don't think you've had any quilting lessons except a few lessons you got from your mother um, way back when you got that tiny little gift from Santa way back. <laughs> oh, yeah. But mother, mother really thought that quilts were old fashioned. So I had to show her that <laughs> they, could be, they could be contemporary. But um, also my grandmother taught me a lot about quilting, about making um, patterns with newspaper. And um, she gave me some of my first collection of fabrics and they were the, the flower sack fabrics. Oh gosh. Yes, it was so exciting. Yeah. <laughs> In, yeah. in some of Marc Chagall's uh, wonderful, which the, also the quills remind me of stained glass windows um, because they're, they're, they they could be cut out in glass and fitted in. Uh, oh, stained glass in a is a huge but, inspiration. But Chagall would in his uh, in the in his twelve tribes thing in the in the uh, synagogue in Jerusalem, particularly where I have a book with all the different stages for each of the twelve tribes. He would take. Uh, one of the steps would be cutting out colored paper and putting it in different places on the drawing to indicate what he used for colors. And I don't see what he was seeing when you look at that. It, it's like, but but uh, you know, it was part of the process that that goes on. And also, I think it's very important for any any of us as we, as we create things and to create it for the right reason, but also create it with confidence and promoting what we do also because it's God's work. 
Mm -hmm. uh, that's also very important to know. Uh, but it, it's better to quilt than to quit. <laughs> Amen. Well, I, I don't really fully understand what is pushing me, but I do really believe that I'm supposed to do this. Yeah, you are, of course, <laughs> certainly. Yeah. And we're all supposed to do if we're composing. <laughs> Whether you're 11 years old or 88 years old, you're that may be something that's, I, you know, we're designed to do different things. Yes, I'm, I'm really lucky that I know what it is. Amen. How about now we're going, we have uh, looking for heaven on earth. Can you tell me about that? Um, and, and, or, and, and, and Walter. Well, that piece, um, I think it's, it's, um, well, it's a scene that is a is the combination of a cathedral and a tree and the tree is reaching up out of the ceiling of the cathedral that um is something that i'm still trying to produce i have tried several times to make a quilt that that describes looking for heaven on earth um and then i have i have one that you saw at the beginning of that um the floral quiltings that is called heaven on earth and that is this exquisite cave <laughs> with a waterfall it just makes you feel like you're in heaven it's just so beautiful and so different. Um, but like I say, I have yet to be able to create that that's in my mind and in my heart. Um, I was recently in Washington and went to see the um, National Shrine. And so moved by the architecture and the decoration and the um and the stories that my cousin told me as we went through and looked at the um at the cathedral so i hope that i can somehow combine the natural world with the cathedral um i'm not there yet but um, I think that will be a wonderful one to hear the music that Walter creates when well, I finally yeah, make my it. My <laughs> sister-in-law, she's she's there, but uh, I I get it, I get it. I am just so glad you keep trying to do that because those are my favorite quilts of yours, cathedrals right. of fabric that uh, you know, cathedrals of cloth, literally. Uh, that uh, do touch nature and man's best creations. And that's what I tried to capture in the opening movement of quiltings, which we will hear now and see. <laughs>
Would you ever design a room? A cathedral is enormous, of course, but but a a room where you would where it would be a chapel with quilts. Oh, I would love uh, they they have I have shown in in churches, especially when they have a gallery space. Well, that would be wonderful. It would. Um, but you know, I'm really not capable of making a lot of large pieces now. I have Parkinson's and that makes it harder for me to maneuver a large piece. So. You know, Henri Matisse did his masterpiece, which doesn't, masterpiece doesn't mean better than other people. Masterpiece means your best piece. <laughs> masterpiece is a chapel of the rosary in Vence in France. And he was bed, he was bedridden, and and he could not really sit at an easel much anymore, and so he would cut out he would paint paper and would uh, uh, and cut it out in shapes <coughs> and it would be a rearranged to become patterns. And the chapel in Vance and other other works of his in his last years, he was he was able to do that. So. Uh, God will provide a way for you and good health in Jesus' name for you and also to Thank protect you. you in Jesus' name. Well, let's just pray for Anne for a minute right now. Let's not a minute. Let's pray for Anne. Father, we thank you in Jesus' name that you, she has a very sweet spirit. She's a very loving and a kind person. We pray that you will protect her. We plead above Jesus over her from this illness. And it will not advance and will be arrested and that she will be able to continue to do other works that are on her heart, whatever they are, not what I think, but what, what she thinks and what you think. And, uh, and just bless her. Thank you, Lord, for your protection for her. Thank you, Lord, for your protection for all of us. Uh, we need you, Jesus, and we depend on you. Amen. 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 So beautiful. Keep going, Anne. <laughs> yeah, well, I wanted I wanted to say something when you said you kept wanting to do that cathedral with tree the way it should be done. Yes. It, rem it reminded me uh, uh, the the famous pianist Arthur Rubinstein had played the bait, uh, I think it's the fourth concerto. It's the one that has this beautiful section of opening chords. Oh, yes. And yes, it, it is just so gorgeous. And obviously at his age, he probably had played it publicly a hundred of times and, and you know, all that. In an interview that, that he was going to do the concert, but they did the interview ahead of the concert and played it, you know, uh, at, at a, an appropriate place in the concert. He said, he said, I hope one day to play these chords the way Beethoven intended for them to be played. Mm. Oh. <laughs> oh, wow. When you said that about, I'm still trying to get that the way I see it, you know, <laughs> that made me think of what he said. That That's the true artist and the true person who who feels God being led I, I just never I've never forgotten that it you know someday now here's this famous you know that I'll play them the way Beethoven intended them to be played. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you keep oh, trying on that cathedral and tree <laughs> I will I can't stop you know I can't stop <laughs> that's good well, Kaleidoscope is next. A fugue accompanies beautiful symmetrical patterns depicting all kinds of natural events, including some hurricanes that have terrified North Carolina over the years. May we see that and then we'll talk about it? Thank you. 
uh, excuse me, let me see if I can, well, that might be hard to do. Stop share. Okay. <laughs> that, wow. Yes. Those are, are those exactly symmetrical and? Yes. Precisely. Yes. <laughs> so this, they're not little approximate discrepancies in this. So you mm -hmm. cut, you cut each thing out eight times or something? Yes, eight or 64 times. At one point I had Hurricane Fran, all the pieces cut out on a round table in little stacks of the shapes. And my wild and crazy young sons ran through the room and knocked the table and knocked them all off. Whoa. They were in trouble. <laughs> oh, another hurricane. Yeah. <laughs> Reminds me of a man I knew named Siegfried Deem, and he made a huge stained glass, he installed a stained glass window in the church. And the whole thing fell on the floor and broke apart. And, oh, no. and what he said, the first words were, praise the Lord. Oh. You know, um, for years, I was inspired by Rose Window and just would stare at those. When I was doing the kaleidoscopes, that was what I was trying to do. <laughs> I was thinking they all look like Rose Windows. That's that's what, and then I thought, oh, wait a minute, this is called kaleidoscopes. I get yeah. it. <laughs> it look like Rose Windows. Yes, that's that's really what they should be called is rose windows because that's what they were inspired by but you know um i went to work at uh art space which is a group of artists in raleigh that um had studios open studios open to the public completely and um we had a critic in the building who um, wrote for the local paper, was an art critic. And he said that I was using symmetry as a crutch. So that, that completely changed my outlook about making kaleidoscopes. I just, you know, I couldn't look at them except as a crutch. And I- That isn't true. I was rebellious. <laughs> hey, Anne, uh, I'm not a, an art critic, but I'm a, a, a theater critic, so I can uh, let me tell you, put this out there. Take what we write as a grain of salt, please. <laughs> I do, I do. But you know, if it affects you, you know there's some validity to it. If you get to a point that you can't think about it the same way as you did before, then you have to realize that this is authentic. So he, uh, he made a difference. I would never have probably not have made the um, Jupiter series or um, there's one named Church in the Wildwood that I made after, after that criticism. So you're saying the criticism help you go in another direction? Yes. So you, and I'm happy that it did. Well, that then that's 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 okay. There's a oh, uh, there's an architect who does all these really way Frank Gehry, and he they asked him how do you handle because his buildings are in, impossible looking. They look like wedding cakes and all kinds of things. Yeah. Have you seen ever Frank Gehry's? Yes. So, and a lot of people love his work and some people do not like it at all. So they asked him, how do you handle criticism? He said, when they get a criticism, I put it on like an article of clothing for a few days. If it mm -hmm. fits, I leave it on. If it doesn't, I take it off. Perfect. That's a perfect description. Yeah. And if you don't have wind in your sails, you don't go sailing. <laughs> so... I was just no longer inspired to do a kaleidoscope or a rose window. Though I think about it sometimes. 
Walter, in that music, did you try to have a kaleidoscope in the music? Well, it is, of course, um, a fugue, which in a sense is a kaleidoscope of its subject going all yeah. over the place. And that was really what I thought would, this is where I said, if I have the right form, then the rest of it is somewhat elementary. At least it's become somewhat elementary for me to write a fugue once I know that I need to write one. And uh, of course I felt uh, that it would be fun to have a little fun at the very end of getting into more of a boogie woogie style. <laughs> And uh, I love the end of that. <laughs> need to go out and play, don't we? Mm -hmm. Yep. And going back to Flora and Jupiter, Walter, those were very different pieces. Um, Flora has your love of, uh, you know, Bach and inventions and fugues and all that stuff. And Jupiter is, is more. Um, I don't know, heroic, it's a different, if it's a different, uh, different genre. So you, you, you it's work. more abstract. Yeah. It is, isn't it? Yeah. Which is, which is better, Walter? <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's the correct <laughs> answer, yes. Yes is the correct answer, yes. <laughs> I think so. Uh, although I will say that, uh, I will confess a Ray Fawn Williams moment at the end of Jupiter. And it may be, you know, we think about Gustav Hulse and the Jupiter theme, which, by the way, I heard when I was just sitting there at the Eastman's Theater enjoying orchestra music. Um, but when I, um, uh, I just felt I needed a Ray Fawn Williams moment. And so that last variation, the quiet one uh, for the solar uh, eclipse number two, uh, is basically just a quiet hymn of reverent praise to God for his creation of which Jupiter's just a tiny chunk of rock. Mm. Or gas. Or gas, <laughs> whatever it is. <laughs> I mean, I'm not a, an astronomer. <laughs> So, yeah, uh, they're different pieces. Uh, thankfully, the Lord can lead me in different directions, just like he does my sister-in-law. So now we're going to hear a riff on Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star, <laughs> titled Stellar Nursery, from the astronomy section of Quiltings. And could you give me a 30-second de definition of a stellar nursery? It's a place where stars are born. And we don't mean Judy Garland in this case. We're talking about real stars. No, yes, real stars. Nebula is another word for it. But it's it's the place where stars are born and also where stars die. And they're re recreated. Yes. Well, let's hear that. We're going to listen. So we're going to hear apparently Twinkle Twinkle Little Star in this. So please listen carelessly, carefully. <laughs> okay. Start screen. Share.
Oh, that's great. Let's hear it again. <laughs> And Walter, we need to talk about Daphne because she produced these, these videos. Oh, I can't hear you. Well, it helps if I'm unmuted, doesn't it? Yeah, we, we do need to mention that she really put all of the videos together. I'm so glad she came back in. <laughs> Yes. Uh, He's fixing so, supper. <laughs> but uh, she uh, she helped me put the videos together. I did more of the work on um, Flora and Jupiter, but I learned from the best. <laughs> oh, and by the way, since we are bragging about our common relative, I should point out that if it weren't for Daphne, both Anne and I would be up the creek without a paddle. Daphne designed and maintains our websites to this yeah. day. This is huge. Stay there, Daphne. Don't run off. For, away well, from I'm me. not. I just. I don't have a place to sit right here. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's okay. <laughs> No, I, I need to get back to the kitchen. I, I realized that it was getting late and I needed to start fixing supper. Out here Californians eat so early, I don't know, or later. But... <laughs> uh, Great had... job, Daphne. Great job. Where did you hold your video skills, Daphne? I realized a while ago that no one was going to promote Walter's music without a website and no one was going to make one if I didn't teach myself how to do it. So I basically um, taught myself how to do um, website design, WordPress, and um, I don't do a lot of coding. I can do a little bit, but I basically rely on WordPress's uh, um, templates, which is helpful. And then I uh, taught myself how to do, I guess I went to a guy at, at Fresno Pacific that helped me a little bit learning um, Final Cut Pro video. And so that's that's basically what we use, yeah. Don't, so. don't get her started with HTML. <laughs> She's really pretty good at that too. And like Schoenberg and Anne, she's self-taught. Must be, must be the blood. Yeah, <laughs> she's happy to be paid with quilts. Yes, definitely. We oh, have some we are, lovely quilts around here. We are the proud <laughs> owners of several Harwell quilts. Yes. And yes. covetous of many more. And I better go check on this food okay. before it burns. But <laughs> lovely. Yeah. Thank you, Daphne. Yes, good to be here. Big, big applause! Big, big applause! <laughs> For my sister-in-law. Round of applause. <laughs> well, it's bedtime for me here. Let's, well, before you take a snooze, uh, <laughs> let us put in next month, we will be having a, a Christmas listening uh, room. And we will have music by another Ann Johnson, oh. uh, the, the songwriter Ann Johnson. She has a beautiful song that uh, we'll hear. And we'll hear music by Robert Myers. You'll hear oh, a disguised cool. Christmas song. And Brian Nelson, 
He has a, a, a kind of a liturgical uh, Catholic thing, which is great. And then Heather Savage's piece, which a lot of you have already heard, uh, which is the end of a, uh, on a CD. That'll be in December. And in January, we will, last week, I was at an SCI conference and I met a wonderful composer named uh, uh, Nilo Alcala, who is from the Philippines and a very wonderful Christian man, I might add. And uh, his music is a, it's a mixture of Filipino sounding things with a choir and all these instruments with, uh, uh, you know, metallophone kind of stuff like you have in Indonesia. Like it's, it's, it's yeah. be very interesting. That'll be in January. Beyond that, and if you look up I.J. Yarison, who is from Nigeria and had a program on a few hours earlier than us, uh, you can find him on YouTube. His, uh, his uh, program today was a song cycle. Uh, I.J. Yarison, Y-A-R-I-S-O-N. You might want to tune that in. Yeah, I was going to ask you for the spelling. Oh, uh, well, the last name is Y A R I S O N, Yari Sun. Um, and um, we need someone to close us in a prayer. I'll do that. Father God, thank thee so much for bringing us together. Thank thee for this time with my sister-in-law and for uh, great quilts and wonderful music that are truly gifts from thee through us to the world and especially to one another this evening. Now anoint us with strength for the week ahead. Thank thee for Bill's good work in presenting these listening rooms and these listening lists together. And we ask now for thy peace and thy providence and thy goodness to go with us this week and this month. And thank thee. Let us have a happy Thanksgiving because we are thanking thee. And thank thee so much for sending Jesus. Amen. 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 It was lovely to meet all of you. Thank you so much for sharing. Yes. You. <clears throat> Take care. Have a good week. Thank Bye. you. Come again. Bye. God bless you all. God bless Bye. you. Bye-bye.